$350,000 of student loans was taken care of by the military. The dogs were so effective at finding explosives that they were targeting the dogs. Well, they're trained and certified on over 25 different explosives. So the scent's crazy, crazy effective. And they spent billions and billions of dollars of counter explosive technology, jammers, x-ray and radar, all these things. They were not near as effective as the dogs. The dogs found all of the explosives all the time. Certain units were not even allowed to leave the secured perimeter unless you had a dog with you. So that's how good those dogs were. They trained on every platform. You know, we would fast rope out of helicopters with the dogs, go everywhere. We had to know what was inside those buildings, what was waiting. We'd send the dog in, but these dogs have little cameras that are sitting on their back. And so you can be outside the building with your iPad, getting a live feed from the dog. It's almost like, you know, sending a drone in. Losing a dog is very difficult because they become part of the unit. Ultimately, their main job is to make sure that the service members come home. Today we have a very special guest, Dr. Sean McPeck. So Sean and I went to vet school together and I have to say Sean was kind of like a Dr. McPeck now. Um, he's kind of like a big brother to me all throughout vet school. So he has a really amazing story of how he became a veterinarian and we're so happy to have him here. So thank you so much for joining us. Oh uh, yeah, thanks Melinda. Appreciate it. It's great to see you and I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. So he's the founder of a large veterinary hospital in Alaska. Is it Anchorage? Palmer. We're about 50 miles north of Anchorage. Okay. Do you have like an official title? Yeah, I'm the CEO and a veterinarian at Tier 1 Vet Medical Center. Both the owner and I also still work in the floor and do everything. So well, Tier 1 is the largest hospital in the Pacific Northwest right now. We're 25,000 square feet. We have five surgery suites, 80 employees. We have boarded oncologists, boarded ophthalmologists. We have two internal medicine specialists joining us here in a month. Awesome. We do all in one, right? Only hospital in the state. We have specialty, emergency, overnight hospitalization, general practice, rehab, conditioning. We've got a blood bank. I mean, you, you name it. We've got a breeding specialist that does all of the collection. We have a sperm bank, and we recently bought a liquid nitrogen tank for storage of semen for breeding. I mean, we can keep it up to 20 years. So you have that dog that you really love the genetic line on and you want to preserve that, but we can do that. Oh, that's so cool. I saw that you guys recently added I-131, radioactive iodine therapy for the treatment of hyperthyroidism in cats. That was a big project. Been working on it for five years. Wow. Huge. And just to get the licensing for that is a lot. It's radioactive material that you have to get permits for and everything. That's... Yep, exactly. So I thought we'd just talk a little bit about your journey in veterinary medicine and where veterinary medicine has taken you. Yeah, you know, the biggest thing that influenced my career was actually the military. I was active duty military enlisted right out of high school and I was in 3rd Ranger Battalion as a sniper team leader for four years, working my way up from a private. But got out because I really wanted to pursue my education. It was something that I'd always wanted to do. So while I was doing my undergraduate work in biology, I still was in the National Guard. And then when I graduated with my degree in biology, I got told that I was heading over to Iraq. And I said, well, you got one shot. So I applied and luckily got in my first try, but I still was in the National Guard. So getting into Colorado State was a huge success in my life. Then I had to find a National Guard unit. The only one that was there that would take an infantry officer, which I was an infantry officer, was 19th Special Forces Group. So I was very busy trying to study in veterinary school and then also being National Guard unit. But the neat thing that happened is the active duty component contacted me through a recruiter said, hey, when you graduate, if you'd come back active duty, we'll take care of your school. And that was great because I was an Alaska resident in Colorado paying out-of-state tuition. So uh, $350,000 of student loans uh, was <laughs> taken care of by the military. That's and I loved it the active duty work that I had done before. So I went back into the military as a veterinarian and immediately deployed to Afghanistan for a year. And I went back through Ranger selection because I found out that the Ranger Regiment, which I had been in before, now had a dog program and they needed a veterinarian. So I went back through Ranger selection again 14 years later, and all the guys that I had been in with that were privates were now sergeant majors and first sergeants. And here I am coming back. That's so so cool. that gave me a lot of really neat experience when I deployed to Afghanistan 
many times with the Ranger Regiment because I got to go on target. I got to go with the dog teams and go out on combat operations as a veterinarian. So it was a pretty neat experience. That I is got so out cool. in 2016, but that was a huge influence on my career. Taught me a lot of emergency medicine. The dogs were so effective at finding explosives that they were targeting the dogs. And so I got a a lot, a lot of experience with emergency medicine, a lot of, you know, blast trauma, ballistic trauma. So wow. that piqued my interest in emergency medicine. And I really wanted to start something that Alaska did not have. You're raised in Alaska, right? Raised, not born. My dad oh, moved okay. up here, here when I was four. Yeah. That's really cool. I feel like maybe we should segue and talk a little bit about the military dogs. So what exactly does that look like sure. when you went to Afghanistan? Like how many dogs do they bring with you and what are they trained for? What does their working day look like? I feel like that's something that most sure. of us don't really know about. Yeah. So one, there's a lot of different positions right now in the military for working dogs. Every branch in the military has working dogs. Most of them are used for detection work, but a good handful of them, specifically in some of the law enforcement and special operations side of the house, they're dual purpose, what we call an MPC or a multi-purpose canine. They're used for bite work, for detaining or what we call squirter interdiction or apprehending someone. And also they're trained and certified on over 25 different explosives. Uh, so the scent, finding those explosives that are hidden. And so that's the main purpose. Like course, where would they be hidden? Other... Sorry, like just out there... Yeah, no. Under, like anywhere. under a garbage can uh, or anywhere? Yeah, sure. In a car? Yep, yeah, everywhere. Yeah, they would be everywhere. Very, very creative ways. Hidden under floorboards, in a barrel. But a lot of them were connected to some type of a trigger, like a pressure plate. And so they started uh, really making those pressure plates really sensitive because at first the dogs wouldn't trip them because they weren't heavy enough. And then obviously losing a dog is very difficult because they become part of the unit. But we lost quite a few dogs but ultimately their main job is to make sure that the service members come home. So our dogs that we had in the Ranger Regiment, it's a special operations unit. They're all multi-purpose canines. 99% of them are Belgian Malinois. I would say, you know, a couple here and there, we got some Dutch Shepherds and they go everywhere we go. The global war on terror was a lot of urban stuff, especially in Iraq. You know, we had to know what was inside those buildings, what was waiting. And so Many times we send the dog in right after you know, through a flashbang, just like the law enforcement does. And then the dog goes in afterwards. But these dogs have little cameras that are sitting on their back. And so you okay. can be outside the building with your iPad getting a live feed from the dog going in. And so you can see what's in there. It's almost like, you know, sending a drone in. Yeah. Um, they're really starting to work now, able to have remote commands where the dogs have speakers on their back and they can hear. That's um, so cool. So there's a lot of neat things going on, but yeah, the, the dogs are crazy, crazy effective. Absolutely. Wow. It was very interesting. They spent billions and billions of dollars of counter explosive technology, everything from jammers to x-ray and radar, all these things. They were not near as effective as the dogs. The dogs found all of the explosives all the time. Wow. And they're just absolutely phenomenal. You know, the Marines, not the special operations, but some of the Marine Expeditionary Force units, they all had Labradors. It was the improvised explosive detector dog program. And all of these labs were just so driven to find, you know, they're, they're hunting dogs. Yeah. They want, and so you I mean, they're this. the avalanche dogs too. They're finding people. Sure. Like we've done yeah. demos where you have a, like a big probe line of everyone probing and they time you to see how long it takes you to find the body. And then they send a dog in and they just go right to it and start digging. It's amazing. Yeah. Yep. It's unreal. So yeah, they're very effective and they were so effective that they actually had requirements that certain units were not even allowed to leave the fob or the base or your secured perimeter unless you had a dog with you. Wow. You weren't even allowed. So that's how good those dogs were. So yeah, the unit that I was in, every time we deployed, we had dogs. Cool. They trained on every platform. You know, we would fast rope out of helicopters with the dogs. They would go everywhere. So, so cool. the dogs were an integral part of the unit. People became very attached to the dogs and knew their names, especially when they saved their lives on multiple yeah. occasions. You are pretty grateful to have that dog. How do they alert the uh, people so that they found something? It depends, but most of them are trained to sit down and then okay. look at you. Do they tell you like how far away it is or? Well, it depends. Yeah. So if you are working off leash or on leash, right? They have different leash links depending on where you are, where you're going, the control over the dog. And so some of them do work off lead. 
but you have them off lead when you have good control over the dog, right? You got to be able to recall that dog. Yeah. Um, but they never really go so far and search outside of visual. You'd be able to identify where they were. They wouldn't be so far away that you would lose track of where the dog was. Oh, okay, cool. Can they tell you exactly where the explosive is without triggering it? Oh, well. Like, how do they tell you where it is? Yeah, so you'll see, you know, you can ask them again and they'll, you know, they'll look and and kind of sniff at the area and then sit down and kind of direct you with their nose. But you can pretty much find it if it was attached underneath a vehicle or it was buried somewhere, you'd be like, oh, okay, I can see the disturbed earth. I can see where this does not look right. Oh, okay. Uh, And so then you would, you know, you would have other service members come in and EOD, for example, and they would dismantle or get rid of the the explosive or just avoid that whole area. That's really interesting. So that's where you got a lot of your emergency, probably a lot of trauma experience. Exactly. Yeah. A lot of of experience there, but also, you know, we did a lot of training. Training for deployment required us to do a lot of different type of uh, scenario training where you would be able to get that experience and be ready for the real world stuff. So then you came back to Alaska. And started tier one. Well, actually worked for a corporate hospital for a little bit. I accepted a job. You know, the wife and I talked. She's also a veterinarian. We talked about getting out. Too many close calls and we were just having our second baby. And so just kind of, hey, it's about time. Let's let's go and do something together as a family, you know. And I was gone all the time deployed. So I drug her up to Alaska uh, kicking and screaming. She did not want to come up here. She is from the Northeast and, you know, really loved uh, New England Patriots and Boston Red Sox and, you know, everything. So we don't have that up here, right? So I said, just give me five years. Let me give some experiences to the kids that I grew up with, with the woods and the remoteness of Alaska. And if you don't like it, then we'll move anywhere you want. Just give me five years. And she agreed. And then she fell in love with it. So it worked out great. However, we had both accepted a job for a privately owned hospital, unknowing that he was stacking the deck to be able to sell the clinic. He needed contracted veterinarians that were going to be full time before he could sell the hospital. He was already in negotiations to sell it. And so as we're driving up to Alaska, after having accepted the job about six months prior, he calls us and says, hey, I sold to a corporate entity. Uh, And so went right into working at a corporate, just saw how these corporate entities work and how they pay so little. They don't reinvest in the hospitals. And it takes an act of God to even get something simple, you know, like a new fluid pump. And so the technicians feel like they're not able to do their job effectively. The veterinarians are not able to practice a level of medicine that they want to provide. They do certain things to improve the bottom line for the corporate entity. For example, we had a blood machine in the hospital that we loved because it synced with the software. We could show it on the computer screen to the clients and it was great. Well, they took that out. And they put in their blood machines because they were cheaper. But these blood machines would only print out a little receipt of the blood work. So you have to go in and show that to the owner. But that's an example. You know, they're cutting and saving money everywhere. And so I knew that if I invested in something beautiful, kind of fuel the dreams, right? If you build it, yeah. they will come. That I could get people that wanted to practice gold standard medicine. Technicians wanted to have the ability to practice and be a part of that gold standard medicine and have that equipment, be able to do that job effectively. So I came into it focused on reinvesting. I I didn't take a paycheck for the first three years and just reinvested everything. So I got a CT machine. uh, I got two C arms for fluoroscopy uh, and then two of everything, two x-ray tables. We've got five ultrasound, like like, beautiful ultrasound machine. But I just kept investing in the highest end stuff that I could get because at the time I had a resident trained surgeon and really invested in making sure that everybody could practice and offer to the client the best, right? Well, not everybody can afford the best, but you start, you start there. Like, Hey, this is the best that I can offer you. This is where it's going to be the most effective, but then you work with them. Right. And I know that's going to lead into some other questions about practice and stuff, but I always wanted to be able to offer the best. And what I found is that there was a market for it. There are people that really wanted to have gold standard medicine. They really want to do, you know, and where before you go back 20 years, it was hard enough to get people to even bring their dog to the vet. Yeah. Uh, Let alone you start offering a CT or an MRI to be able to figure out what's going on. You know, now that's what, what we do. It's like more and more, I mean, I think they said that over 90% of millennial pet owners think of their pets as part of the family. So there's like this rise in this new generation of pet parents where it's like they actually think of their fur kids as fur kids. 
And so as a doctor, I always look at my patients like someone's for a kid. When you make your recommendations, always from the standpoint of what is in that for a child's best interest, as though it were someone's kid, then it really simplifies the way that you practice medicine because you're always thinking about the patient like somebody's child. So when you start to make your recommendations from that standpoint, it really strips away a lot of the confusion and the noise in the profession. And then obviously what you start to realize is if you're a doctor who makes your recommendations from that standpoint, a huge barrier in you actually providing that level of care is the owner's position. Not only on, yeah, like, do they have any idea what medical care costs? In Canada, especially, most people don't because medical care is free. When you go to the emergency room, when you have surgery, you never see a bill. You never see the bill that those hospitals submit to whatever government entity pays it. So that's really shocking for people who haven't had like a basic crash course in pet ownership. Then there's also a lot of ingrained beliefs about spending money on medical care for pets. And I feel like most people's parents and grandparents, that was never part of the experience of pet ownership because veterinary medicine is completely different now from what it was 50 years ago. Like 50 years ago, for the most part, your average dog owner was not taking their dog to the vet to have its fracture surgically repaired or whatever it may be, cancer treatment, herniated disc surgery. Like that stuff wasn't around really or available. No, so not at all. Even coming down to humane euthanasia, right? I mean, it's, you know, grandpa took the dog behind the barn type thing, you know? Yeah. And so it's a completely different era and it's a very unique opportunity to be able to be a part of that expansion of desire for good medicine. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be able to practice excellent medicine. And obviously you're very limited when somebody comes in and they say, well, I can't afford x-rays. I can't afford ultrasound. I can't. Aff-. And so it's like, okay, well now I'm just guessing. Uh, and I'm happy to, to offer that to you, but you, under, you got to understand as you take away more and more of these diagnostics, and I'm guessing if you can't afford yeah. blood work and you can't afford an x-ray, then it may be an obstruction. I don't know. Uh, I don't know why your dog is vomiting. We can do this, but you got to understand, I don't know what's going on until I can start yeah. doing these diagnostics. So when somebody has pet insurance, it completely takes that out of the equation. And now we get to offer the best and we become much more effective as doctors. You know, a lot of times we don't have to have that conversation with them where now they're considering humane euthanasia for that obstructed GI because they let their dog eat something that they shouldn't have and they need to go to surgery to save it, uh, but they can't afford the surgery and the possible hospitalization that would go afterwards. And I get that. Not everybody has $5,000 waiting for a rainy day for your vet bill, but that's the reality of the situation. If you want to fix that ruptured cruciate ligament and your agility dog, well, that's an expensive TPLO surgery. You know, if you want to Get your dog feeling better by getting that splenectomy because it's got a bleeding hemangiosarcoma in there. And, uh, you know, that that surgery is expensive. So having pet insurance is something that is very, very smart. But everybody gets a pet and they think that worst case scenario, it's not going to happen to me. I'm not that my dog's not going to, but ultimately (laughs) it will. You will at some point be faced with that conversation with that veterinarian where they're presenting you with an estimate that is going to be expensive. It's going to be shocking. People have no idea how expensive it is to have equipment, to purchase these medications, to pay your employees, especially when we're a 24-hour hospital, keeping those lights on. It's expensive. Being a pet owner, I can't recommend enough to get pet insurance. People come in, we ask them, oh, do you have medical insurance? This is very serious. This could get really expensive. And they say certain names of certain insurance companies. And it's just like, you just look around and you see everyone take a huge sigh of relief. Like, oh, you know, we can just do what we need to do to help this patient. And we don't have to worry about all the drama that comes along with owners being unwilling or unable to pay for their pets' medical care. That is, I think, probably one of the most stressful parts of the job is people not being aware of the cost of medical care, not being prepared for it. In some cases, just feeling like it's not their responsibility to pay for it. Like, I can't tell you how many people have just looked at me like I should cover their bill. And I'm just like, would you go to a restaurant, order a bunch of food, and then look at the waitress? Like, are you going to pick up my bill? 
<laughs> no, we're the workers. We're, the we're providing the service. We're serving you. You're ordering. It's your meal. <laughs> so. Yep. I have that conversation daily. Uh, and if you were to go on to the reviews, 90% of the negative reviews that we get are because of the cost. Yeah, they uh, don't want to pay for it. They don't want to pay for it. And, and saying that, you know, we only care about money. Why aren't you doing this? If you really cared about animals, you would help and you would cover this. So, Why won't you take a payment plan? Well, I don't have the ability to keep a bank. Like loaning service. you. Right. Exactly. I, I don't have the ability to be loaning hundreds of thousands of dollars to strangers exactly. who will never pay me back. Like, never pay you back. You can look at the statistics. I mean, uh, thank goodness they're starting to mandate that veterinary programs teach a little bit of small business, a little bit of hospital management courses because veterinarians were known for doing that. And that's why you go back 20 years ago and the, the highest bankruptcy business was a privately owned veterinary hospital because they were basically convinced that they had to do that. And unfortunately didn't have pet insurance back then and veterinarians were, were doing that and losing out. And so having that conversation that, Hey, that's not your responsibility. You're their veterinarian. You're not their financial advisor. Okay. But I'm not in this for the money. I'm in this because I love the work. You know, you're right. The, the hardest conversation is when somebody doesn't have the money and you're trying to find them ways. You're trying to find a uh, charity. You're looking at, you know, scratch pay or these different credit applications. Care credit. And yep, exactly. And now you know that you can save that animal because uh, you've diagnosed it and you know that it's got an obstruction, right? You can do that surgery. You can save it, but they get denied for the scratch pay. They get denied for the care credit. They don't have any money. And now you're faced with humane euthanasia. And that's a tough one. If somebody would have taken the time and spent that 25 bucks a month for your pet insurance, you wouldn't even have that conversation. But what we know right now is what 10% of the population of pet owners have pet insurance. So it's yes, still a lot aren't doing it. I try to preach it, but unfortunately it's not as popular yet as it, I hope it will be. But yeah, so, that's, that's yeah. a tough one, right? Money's emotional. And so when you're doing emergency, it gets even more emotional because somebody ran over their own dog, right? And so they're so emotional now. And then you start talking about money and now it triples the emotion. And if they can't afford it, then they look at you and they're looking for somewhere else to blame. And yeah. then obviously the online comments, it's just like any other social media thing. People want to play the victim, right? And so they go on there and they try to create a narrative that it was somehow the veterinarian's fault when we didn't cause this, we're just here to help. Yeah, which is why I think it's so important. Like, I mean, at some point, I feel like the pet industry needs to be regulated the same way they regulate people driving cars. It's like, if you're gonna get one, we need to make sure that you've taken this basic crash course so you know how to avoid these catastrophic situations. You know, I wanna say like probably close to half of the emergencies that I see are preventable if people only knew how to be an effective babysitter, basically. And then also how to avoid these situations that turn into massive dramas by basically protecting yourself, having good medical insurance for your pet, knowing the basic ropes. So, I mean, imagine if we were letting everyone drive cars with no insurance, with no driver's ed, not knowing what the street signs mean, the directions on the highway. Like that's kind of the way I see the pet industry right now. It's just completely unregulated, lots of accidents waiting to happen. It could just be so much better run if there were some basic rules in place. Yeah. When I see up here, a lot of the preventable injuries and some of the severe cases are people not having good understanding of training, uh, basic obedience. Recall. 100%. Recall is the biggest thing. If you if that dog is locked onto, for up here being Alaska, that moose, and they want to chase after it, if you're not able to recall your dog and switch that, that prey drive, that's an instinct in them, then you don't have good enough training. You need to be able to stop that dog with a recall and recall them back in the worst type of scenario because that is where we see it. We see it with the dog fights being off leash and not being able to call your dog. We see it with dogs getting into porcupines, dogs yeah, getting attacked life. by bears, dogs getting stopped by moose, running out into the highway, you know, and all that's preventable, but all the simple preventable obedience, traumas. which nobody yeah. takes the time to do, but everybody wants to have their dog off leash. Yeah. Because it's almost like, you know, some of these things I feel like are almost like a rite of passage in pet ownership. Like that's what people were modeled of like, what a good dog owner is, is like they have this idea, you know, from 
old Yeller replays on the Disney Channel of, you know, the young boy and his dog going off on adventures off leash and the dog is getting into altercations with wolves and bears and porcupines and then they come home and like the mom sews him up <laughs> and like they do a lot of DIY vet care at home and then right. at the end when it's time for the boy to become a real man, he has to shoot his dog that has contracted a vaccine preventable disease in modern day. You know, so it's like we have this like nostalgia for dog ownership that comes from a different time when we didn't have traffic, we didn't have vaccines, we didn't have people driving around texting on cell phones. So I think that there's a little bit of a clash between that idea of dog ownership and then the kind of danger it sets you up for in an urban or suburban place where sure. that kind of behavior is going to get you into sure. trouble, you know? Yep, 100%. And not to mention, worst case scenario, right? When you see the dogs that people don't keep track of, they have no obedience training, and there may be some more breed uh, specific instances but you know uh dogs being off leash and attacking a, a little kid that's walking around so oh my god um, yeah. i'm so triggered yeah, by that because i was yeah, like at the tennis of- courts the other day and like i literally look up and like some guy's like lifting his shirt and there's like blood everywhere and i'm just like it turned out it was the same guy i had seen literally the previous morning with his dogs off leash and that one of them was like running into traffic and then the next day I see him, same dog, same guy, same dog's off leash, and this one's like bitten a guy, and I'm just like, (laughs) (laughs) that's going to end in problems if you don't intervene, you know? Yep, exactly. But yeah, Um, okay, so I want to just touch a little bit more on corporate vet med, if possible, what that is, like what that means. So some of the corporate chains, when they will buy a privately owned practice, they'll actually rebrand it. Like VCA will rebrand the practice that they bought and put their letters on it. So everyone knows it's VCA, it's corporate now. But some of the other chains don't do that. And so the people still go there thinking it's mom and pop's old vet hospital, but really the inner workings of it have become very corporate. So there was a hospital, they ended up selling to one of the corporate chains, one of those like high production, production, production scenarios, lots of elective surgery all day, but their management is too cheap or whatever to basically buy them the equipment that they need. And obviously the technicians and the doctors want to be offering good medicine. So they would be coming over to like borrow my equipment, my anesthesia monitor. But I'm just like, why am I paying for your hospital's equipment? Like that makes no sense, you know? So um, yeah, what does corporate medicine mean? And like all these huge mergers with large corporate veterinary chains and huge companies like Mars and Mars, what's going on with that? Yes. You know, I can only speak on my experience, right? I can only speak for my experience, but I know that there's a lot of different corporate entities out there and they're competing. And so you're right. BCA, for example, they do that. They make sure that their big blue and white sign is out front right away and they do change out stuff in the hospital. And so all I can speak of that I noticed, and it may not be across the board. I don't want to paint a brush here and give every single corporate entity lumped together in the same basket. But from what I've heard from people working for different ones and where my experience was, is that it wasn't about the patient care. It wasn't about the quality of medicine. It wasn't about how well the, the staff were taken care of. It was about what is the, the cheapest way that we can operate this hospital so that all the profits are going back to this corporate entity? And that's what I was saying. Like the doctors were getting nothing compared to the privately owned one. And the same thing. I mean, the technician, I remember I recruited a technician. She was a licensed veterinary technician. She had been working at this corporate hospital. It had been bought out, but she was still making $12.50 an hour. And I immediately started paying her over $20 an hour. Now it keeps driving up, but that's the reality of the corporate side from what I saw is that they were underpaying staff and not reinvesting in equipment. I mean, we had an x-ray machine go down and it took weeks and weeks to get it repaired because they didn't want to pay somebody locally that was more expensive than them flying up a tech to do it. Uh, So You know, those type of experiences were across the board. And when I talk with other people, even some of the other corporate entities have flowchart medicine. 
literally you don't get to practice medicine as a doctor and get creative with offering different things. It's, you know, if patient does this, you go to here. Yes or no to coughing. Yes. Okay. Well, then you prescribe X, Y, Z. You know, you don't get to really practice what medicine is. And so, you know, it takes a little bit out of the, being a doctor and being that provider experience out of it when you start getting told how to treat a patient and what to do. But, you know, I think there are good things on the corporate side, right? You know, as a privately owned hospital, you are operating on what you are making, right? And that's it. And when I have good months, then I want to try to reward my staff. I want to do team building things. I want to get them, you know, a gift and be able to reward that. But if I have a bad month and payroll still needs to go out, then I've got to cover that as the owner, right? And so, and how long can I do that? How many bad months in a row until I can't survive, right? But the reality is, is that if you're corporate owned and you're not profitable, well, you've got a corporate entity, a big, you know, Scrooge McDuck vault that is going to keep feeding that hospital to keep it alive. And so that's very hard for the private sector to be able to compete with, especially when you have, you know, the experience of COVID, right? And my experience of COVID, that's what allowed me to grow so fast. As bad as COVID was, I refused to go along with kind of this mentality that just people were just blindly doing these things that made no sense. They wanted to go to curbside only. They wanted to mandate all of this masking and vaccines and uh, distant stuff. And, and, And so I refused to do that. I said no to all of it. I was like, and I, I, had meetings with all my employees and I told them, I was like, look, I'm not mandating a vaccine. I'm not mandating masking. We are going to continue to operate like a hospital and owners want to be with their pets. They don't want to hand it off and not know what goes on and then get a call. And you have no idea, you know, they want to have that interaction with the doctor. Uh, So I expected going into when I started hearing the chatter, we started hearing things about lockdowns. Well, it's only two weeks to flatten the curve. I started predicting when I met with my leadership team that we were going to lose probably about 25% uh, business just because people are going to be at home, whatever. However, because I chose to stay open, because I chose not to enforce all of this, I had an increase of over 35% because people were flocking to our hospital. They were driving over you know, 100 miles because their veterinary practices in their area were all doing curbside only and mandating certain things. So they weren't I, allowed to be present during their exactly. dog's euthanasia and some places. Right, crazy. Like I was like, I would never have been able to enforce that. It made no sense. I was like, you have to be there with your your child. Yeah, exactly. Well, that is very interesting. We're already over a bit. Do you want to call it there? Thank you so much for joining us for all of your service and hard work. 